As America commemorates the 11th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on U.S. soil, its drones have killed yet another senior Al-Qaeda leader on the African continent. Joining us to discuss whether Africa is indeed the new front in the war against terror is former U.S. diplomat Brooks Spector. He joins us in our Johannesburg studio. When we also joined in Nairobi with Morris Nsamba, he's a research fellow at the African Research and Resource Forum. Brooke, uh, let me start with you. Um, is it correct to say that Africa is indeed the new front um, on the war on terror? I would put it just slightly differently. I would say that Africa, or some of the countries in Africa, I think that's probably fair, are one of the fronts for this activity, even though the U.S. government no longer refers to it as a war on terror. Uh, they take a, a more general approach. Um, I mean, some of the countries in Africa obviously are not part of this process. I mean, South Africa clearly isn't, Botswana obviously isn't, Namibia and so forth. But some of the countries in the Sahel and then going further to the east very clearly are places where there are problems and where there is assistance and some military activities. Uh, let me bring in Morris here. Morris, in Kenya, Morris, let me bring you in here. Um, if we, if we um, look at Kenya, um, Kenya has experienced quite a lot of violence uh, very recently. You have the problem of Al-Shabaab. Um, how confident are you that the Kenyan government is actually able to deal with the security and terror threats uh, posed by the various groups operating in that country? Uh, thank you. Um, I think the Kenyan government has capacity to deal with the uh, some of the challenges that are posed by the terror groups. But certainly, if you look at uh, terrorism, it's not like uh, uh, any other form of crime. It, it has a regional implication. Uh, the terror groups we're talking about, Al-Shabaab operates uh, small groups uh, which are outside the borders of Kenya as a country. Uh, I mean, they are spread ar along the entire uh, coast of, um, of, of East Africa. They are in Somalia. Uh, so it's, it, 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 it cannot be resolved as merely an internal question, but um, at a regional level. And uh, that's why we, we see countries like Uganda, Burundi, Kenya, um, in, in, Som in, in Somalia today, because uh, the, the terror groups cannot be fought on at home. You can only uh, look at the internal mechanisms that increase security at home, but also you won't fight it at 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 at, um, at at its base. So you keep it at you keep it away from uh, uh, you keep away from these groups from entering the country. Uh, certainly, the, can, the Kenyan government has had its challenges, um, uh, some of which are logistical, but also some some related to the entire security architecture in East Africa. Uh, you, you you need to appreciate the fact that uh, uh, until uh, th this morning or yesterday. The, the, the Somalia did not have a president uh, in, in terms of um, uh, a fully fledged uh, gov government. Uh, it was up until recently where, when the transitional government uh, uh, stopped uh, functioning and now they are in the process of setting up a government. Uh, until we have a fully functional government in, in, in Somalia, that will then begin to deal with uh, some of the al uh, um groups uh, within Somalia and then begin to work with the regional um, bodies uh, and, 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 and leaders to, 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 to thrash out these uh, groups. Uh, certainly, terror is going to be part of... Yeah, let me come in here. I want to bring uh, Brooks in. We're talking here about regional cooperation on the African continent, but of course the, the war on terror, even if it's no longer called that, is driven largely by, by America. What kind of increased security cooperation have we seen between African states and the U.S. to try and deal with this issue, particularly in places like Somalia, as Morris have said, where you've had very weak governments or in fact sometimes failed states? Well, I, I think Morris's point, uh, one of the points that he made is, is, very, is, is really crucial and we need to, to, to draw it out a little bit. And I'll, I'll get to your question in a sec. Uh, the very nature of this activity is that it is not state-to-state -state activity. It transcends borders or it ignores borders because the groups themselves do not recognize the sanctity of an international border or within one country. And so, for example, in West Africa, 
there are a number of activities in which there are, there are small scale drone flights to locate, to track, to identify, and to help guide dealing with uh, such activities and such organizations. And you find something of the same kind of thing without the drone plane flights uh, in Uganda dealing with the Lord's Resistance Army. So another point to make is that it is not simply Islamic fundamentalist terrorism, it's groups of various types. And in East Africa, the LRA isn't an Islamic group in any case. Um, to get back to the, the heart of, your, of your, your question, one of the lessons I think that was drawn from Afghanistan and Iraq is that massive military power is not always an answer. In, in fact, sometimes it provokes yet other problems. And so up until now, certainly in Africa, if we put aside Somalia back in the uh, early 90s, uh, one of the responses has been to use very small scale forces, very, very small scale interventions with drone aircraft or with special forces trainers, rather than the emplacement of large uh, formations or groups of military because it turns out that they in, they in turn become targets themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Morris, let me bring you in here. Uh, we were talking here about the issue that you can't just deal with this problem, um, you know, militarily, that you have to look at the issue beyond that. What I wanted to find out um, in Kenyan society, given the fact that we have a large youth population, often marginalized, do Islamist rhetoric uh, resonate amongst the marginalized within Kenya? And can this kind of movement, you know, take root in a place like Kenya? Yeah, I, I think I think it's 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 important. Just you, like it's, it's been mentioned that uh, you, you, for you to do begin to deal with Taylor uh, groups, you, you'd need to begin to address it. Uh, uh, you use the military, but also begin to look at the governance systems in these countries. Uh, f for instance, uh, you, you need that, uh, to look at uh, systems for resource distribution. What are the systems for development within these countries? The, the, the magnetization of, of particular communities and, uh, and the, the government failure to address key socioeconomic needs of communities begins to offer ground for terrorist groups to recruit the youth especially. So, uh, uh, for instance, what is happening in present, in presently in Kenya, the, 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 the violence that's going on in Tana River is related to some of the marginalization that communities in this, some, some communities in this region have, 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 have faced for quite a number of times. And that offers the terror groups a fertile ground to, to recruit. So certainly, when you begin to be, to, you in, to be in position to address terror uh, groups and begin to to, to, to look at uh, security, should, uh, you need to have an holistic view, which begins to look at, which looks at uh, development is, issues, that looks at governance systems, that looks at the, how transformative, for instance, the, the, the governance uh, ref systems are in terms of provisioning uh, uh, youth, uh, for, uh, especially, okay. so that they, they, they have something that that. Uh, uh, pushes them away from uh, the from the pool factors into these uh, terror groups. Morris raises a very important question: the question of um, making it difficult for people to access people who feel marginalised with an alternative ag agenda, an agenda of violence. Um, we've seen in various African countries, particularly to the north, um, massive changes in governments. Egypt uh, had a you know tumultuous change. We've seen the fall of Gaddafi in Libya. Has the these um, political changes, in fact, uh, you know, taken the fight against terror forward, or have we actually seen the rise of Islamist groups in places like, for example, Libya, uh, Brooks? Well, I mean, part of the problem is the answer to that question is yes, yes, no, yes, and no. Uh, in a place like Tunisia, very clearly, the transition, so far at least, has been reasonably, reasonably calm, reasonably stable, reasonably straightforward, and without very, very much violence. The transition in Libya obviously has been very different. The transition in Egypt has been a mix of all of these things and they're still groping their way to figure out how to build that kind of more stable political system. They haven't had a whole lot of practice in doing this at the grassroots level for many years. But look, for example, at a country like Mali, which, has, which now has a serious problem with an insurgent group taking over uh, the northern, what is it, half or third of the country, an area that's about the size of France. Uh, 
Most people thought Mali, although a poor country, was a reasonably stable one, which was making continuous prog progressions in building a more democratic and inclusive society. And very quickly, the, the frailty of that state became demonstrated when very small insurgent groups were able to seize major portions of the country with very little uh, major military effort. And that points to the fact that so many of the countries on the continent, as long as no outside interference happens, may be able to make these steps. The moment there are instabilities that come from other places, from these transnational forces, from these insurgent groups, then the whole house of cards may collapse and we're in a, in a more difficult place. Libya, for example, as it changed over, many of the armament stock became available to groups. And as I understand it, much of the weaponry that the folks in Mali now have came ultimately from weapons that were obtained one way or another out of the, uh, the unfolding uh, collapse of the Gaddafi regime in Libya. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of the issues was also that um, during this fight on terror, a lot of the regimes in particularly North Africa collaborated with America, um, often, um, you know, offering their countries as places where terror suspects, for example, could be interrogated um, under conditions that wouldn't be permitted in America. And this, of course, gave these rulers an opportunity and a chance to foster relations with the superpower, but do very little to democratize and to equalize and close the gaps that Morris has been talking about. Now that these uh, strong men have fallen in many countries, what are the prospects for a more um, holistic approach um, evolving where there's not just security cooperation, but a more long-term view on how to deal with, you know, what feeds this problem. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, traditionally, Egypt has been one of the very large recipients of, of U.S. foreign assistance. But to be honest and to be truthful about it, much of that was military in nature or supportive of the military establishment in one way or another, because the military establishment did and still does control major chunks of the economy. Um, in, from factories to import-export businesses, the whole range of things. It's a chance, but the problem is to figure out how to do this without at the same time intervening or entering more deeply into the political, social, and economic change of the country and becoming aligned or identified with one group versus all the other groups. And this is the kind of thing where I think the people in Washington who have to make these decisions about resource use and allocation are treading very, very diffidently and very carefully because like everybody else in the world, they were caught relatively unaware and un un from the unanticipated activities that began in Tunisia and then worked their way across the Maghreb. Mm -hmm. uh, Morris, what I wanted to find out from you, of course, Kenya has been on high alert uh, for a long period, um, you know, whenever there is an indication that, that attacks might take place. What has been the impact of uh, the violence on the Kenyan economy? And have you been able to convince investors uh, that, that the government does have a plan to actually deal with the, with the insurgency or with the insurgent groups? Um, I think mo w the most affected uh, sector of the economy is tourism. And um, you, you, if you realize uh, most of the hotels and beaches along the coast uh, have been adversely affected, the numbers of tour the tourists coming in the country has tremendously uh, uh, decreased. Um, and certainly a country like Kenya, which has, uh, where tourism is a big contributor, it certainly affected the, 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 the economy. But, 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 but I want to say that uh, in, terms of, in terms of other sectors of the economy, th there is a little that, uh, effect, or the effect has not been that considerable as compared to the tourism sector of, 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 of the economy. Business still goes on as usual. Uh, uh, people could, uh, conduct themselves as they, 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 they used to be. The only cost that I you would say, uh, but, but again also in the mag it's a magnal cost that has been incurred by business persons and investors is the increased uh, expenditure now on security that you have now have to have uh, bodyguard, rather security personnel on each and every other building in the, st in, in the, in the town. And certainly for, 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 for investors, that, that's an extra, extra cost and it digs down into their profits. Uh, 
But just to, 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 to um, re-emphasize the point of um, an holistic approach to security, uh, uh, within the development world, uh, I, uh, at least now there's a shift away from, um, uh, from a state, state building arrangements which me is focused on technical capacity building of the state and now there's increased focus on, uh, on building institutions and specifically the focus on, uh, on, on, on institutional legitimacy, how you begin to build inclusive systems uh, th that are accountable and responsive. I think if, if we go that lane, uh, we're we, we likely to see at least a shift away from um, the current uh, trend of uh, how cooperation with Africa has been uh, um, shaped in the, in the, in the recent past. past. Um, and th it's, it's great now that even within the World Bank, there the, the, is at least a shift towards that um, direction. If you read the, the 2011 uh, World Development Reports, puts emphasis on uh, building inclusive systems, building uh, accountable governments, and, and uh, increased uh, and sustained engagement with, uh, with, uh, with states that are under stress. Uh, fragile and, and, and fragile. So certainly, if if if, we, if momentum is, is built around uh, around those core areas identified by the 2011 um, World Development Report, uh, I mean th they're the same issues that are um, uh, now uh, uh, being focused on by all the major donors in Africa. Uh, we in, we, we 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 may see a shift towards a more holistic approach to security and fragility in African countries. Well, that's where we have to leave it. We say thank you to Morrison Samba, who's a researcher from Nairobi, speaking to us um, on how African countries are dealing with the growing <laughs> specter of terror on the continent. We were also joined by former U.S. diplomat Brooke Spe uh, Spector here in the studio.